Let me put it on to full screen mode. So hopefully you get a little bit better view of that. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a different presentation than one that you might have heard from me in the past. And what we're going to focus on is some concepts that include management, uh, stewardship, character, and also some new content regarding ethical fading. And so I'll talk more about that when we get to that portion of the slide presentation. You can see our contact information there on the slide. Uh, although technically our office is still at 415, we have been since the pandemic began pretty much teleworking. And so the phone number listed there is still a good number for us. We're hooked up to Ring Central, so you can always contact us there. And as well, the uh, email address, compliance at burnco.gov, is always a good way to contact us as well, because my hope is that. You'll take a little bit away from this, some things to think about, but also this should be the beginning of the conversation for us. So you all should have received in the past, and those of you who have clicked in through the Evite, a copy of the county's code of conduct. It is available on our website. We're happy to email it to you. But a couple of points I want to make about it, even though I'm really not going to be focusing on the words in the code so much this afternoon. The first thing to keep in mind is that the code was essentially a creature of a state law known as the State Governmental Conduct Act. And that law was amended in 2011 to allow local governments, county included, to adopt their own codes of conduct. So that's what the county did in 2012. But here's one point of emphasis. The county's code of conduct is an ordinance. It is county law. So to some degree, that elevates it beyond, say, policies, administrative instructions, SOPs, what have you. This applies to all county employees, all elected officials, candidates for county office, and certain classes of volunteers. And one of the things that the code did was to create my office, which is the compliance office. I'm the very first ethics compliance officer the county has had. And as some of you are aware, some of the things we do in addition to training and education and processing complaints is we are a resource for all county employees. We open up channels of communication in an attempt to try to resolve things before they escalate, before they get to a point where they either become a grievance or a complaint or a lawsuit or something like that. And I really don't think I can talk about these things without also talking about them in the with the background of what's going on in the world, not just with the pandemic, not just with how some of us may have changed work environments and also changes in our lives, depending on if you have children who may be teleschooling, you know, you're an educator now, you may be a caregiver. We have all of these different roles that we have to fulfill in addition to being county employees, as well as the elevation in the American conversation right now about issues related to racial and social injustice. My point is, if at no other point, right now, county employees, government employees as a whole are being watched, scrutinized, and evaluated more than ever. So we have to keep this in mind every day, especially with regards to how we decide we are going to represent the county as an organization. So when we talk about ourselves as an organization, we want to be successful, but the way we get to success, in my view, is we build each other up. We support each other. We try to motivate and inspire each other. And the question that we have to address is how do we, as managers, as employees, no matter what our class or, or classification may be, how do we change an unsuccessful mindset or a toxic environment that tends to either blame or hate or complain to one of success? And I'm not suggesting that that's the case at YSC necessarily, but what I am suggesting is I've worked in local government now for the better part of 30 years, both here and in Santa Fe, and I see how attitudes, morale, environments can change over time and they can go through hills and valleys. And so again, a lot of the thrust or the focus of this presentation is to get us thinking about 
those very basic principles, those very ba basic values and practices that we can use to ensure that we are gaining and earning the public's trust. So when we say we're a team, that's not just because we're all thrown together. We're a team because we respect, trust, and care for each other. And those are big words. Those are big concepts. In fact, in the co county's code of conduct, there is a line that says every public servant, every county employee is expected to treat the public and each other with respect, concern, and responsiveness. And more and more these days, because again, the code applies to everybody, I'm seeing more disciplinary actions being brought forward where part or one of the violations that they're investigating is the failure to maintain that duty or obligation that we each carry. So let me just introduce this concept of character because I think character is important not only on an individual basis, but also at, on an organizational basis. So there's this old saying that says what we do when no one else is watching. And in the modern era, I think that can actually be turned a little bit to say character is what we do because everyone is watching. And whether or not we work in an environment, as I'm sure you all do, whether it's cameras and recording devices, it doesn't matter because every member of the public right now is carrying around their own recording device. And so whether you're on site on campus or out in the public, you have to operate as though you're being taped all the time. And I can tell you more and more times these days, I'm having people referred to me for one-on-one -on -one counseling because of the fact that they've confronted a member of the public, they've acted inappropriately, that member of the public then records that interaction and they may send it to us or they may post it on social media. And now it becomes an issue because it becomes a statement or a perception about the county as a whole. So character is what other people learn about us. It's what we learn about ourselves. And we have to be mindful of those times when what we say confronts or conflicts what we do. The most accurate reflection of our motivations is in our character, it's in our behavior, it's in our decisions that we make as representatives of the county as a whole. And each and every one of us, every day, when we either put on the uniform or simply make the decision that we're gonna work, we're gonna take the paycheck, we're making a statement about the county's reputation, about its character, as an organization, as a whole. So here are some quotes that I think are particularly telling these days. Andre Godin, who was a French industrialist, once said, the quality of our expectations determines the quality of our actions. And Craig Johnson, who is an economist at UC Boulder, said, the misery caused by immoral leaders drives home an important point. Ethics is at the heart of leadership. And whenever I talk to managers, directors, DCMs, county manager, elected officials, I tell each and every one of them, it starts with you. You set the standard, you set the bar. Your behavior is going to be the most observed by people around you. And it is also going to be the behavior that people are going to assume is correct and that they can copy or do as well. And then finally, the quote at the bottom there from JFK, I just want to spend a moment on. He said, there are risks and costs to a program of action, but they are far less than the long range risks and costs of comfortable inaction. And as I mentioned, I've worked in local government now for several decades. And I have noticed in that time that there does tend to be certain individuals working within government, and I, I mean all levels of government, who will slide into that arena of comfortable inaction. In other words, doing the least amount necessary just to get by. But let me suggest to you that when we take that attitude, we are feeding those negative stereotypes that the public may have of government workers in general. And some of those negative stereotypes may be Government workers are lazy. 
they're incompetent. Perhaps they're corrupt at a certain level. And the classic image that so many people carry around with them is that of the road crew, right? You're driving down the road, you see the road crew, and there's one person who's digging the ditch and three people standing around watching them. And that creates a perception. And it, granted, might be an uninformed perception. It may be the case that one of the people standing there is an engineer. One may be a safety specialist. One may be a, say, uh, an equipment specialist. But what does the public see? And in these days, especially in, in these days where we see so many people who are taping our interactions with government employees, we have to understand that perception can become just as important as reality. So when we have those interactions with the public, which I know many of you do on a regular basis, we need to use that as an opportunity not only to stand up and try to uphold the county's reputation, but also use it as an opportunity to try to educate members of the public to the extent that we can about our roles and responsibilities, about what we can and cannot do. So this leads me to this concept of stewardship. And stewardship is one in which how are we taking care of those resources, those responsibilities, those powers that are entrusted in us by the public. It is the willingness to accept responsibility for our resources and for our people. And this, again, is a daily commitment. So when I talk about good stewardship, what I'm talking about here is are we weighing every action or inaction against its effect on those around us? because every action, every decision that we make has an impact. It may have an impact on the public, certainly it may have an impact on the residents, but it also has an impact on the workforce. So again, I'm giving you these concepts to just ask yourself, you know, are you doing the types of things that you would expect from other government agencies in terms of fulfilling their responsibilities and using your tax dollars in a responsible manner. And again, this cuts across every layer. Every level of county employee bears these same responsibilities. So that leads us to talking about culture. And culture is something that every office, every department, even the county has. Culture is a way that we build a bridge, if you will, between the county's brand and relevance. And the way culture is developed is based upon individual actions and decisions. These are the bricks that make up that bridge. And each decision, each action represents a data point. And that data point helps make, when we do it in a positive, professional, respectful, dignified way, it makes it just a little bit better, a little bit easier, a little bit more enjoyable for everyone that's impacted. So we need to think about the culture that we have within our organizations, within our divisions, our offices, what have you, because this is the bridge to relevance. So, but what do I mean when I say organizational culture? I mean, it's those shared values, principles, and most importantly, the practices, the ways that we do things that influence the way each one of us acts on a daily basis. And so when we try to develop a positive culture, we try to imbue or instill those values, those ways of thinking, those behaviors to create a supportive environment and one that moves us forward at, towards our goals, our missions. And again, we're at a point now where our your base mission, I'm sure, is the same, but how you achieve some of those goals may have to have been altered just based upon the new restrictions that are placed on us by the pandemic. I saw many of the people who were uh, in the classroom and they're wearing masks. Now, we weren't wearing masks seven, eight months ago. But now it's a part of our culture. It's a part that we have to accept 
as a new practice, a new way of doing things, because it is going to help those around us. And so all of these things feed into the perception that people hold about the organization around them, about the people around them. And again, I've seen things like morale and so forth ebb and flow, even in my time here in the county. But that's why I'm trying to bring us back to these very basic ideas and principles to say, how do we get the needle moving up? So the purpose of culture, why I think is important is it is something that allows uh, people within an organization to know what is expected of them and allows them to relate and work more effectively. And it's those things that permit us or forward or feed us into working towards the mission in a good environment. Culture determines how we interact, how we communicate, how we relate. It determines what is appropriate behavior. I mean, we have all of these things that tell us what is appropriate behavior, whether it be in the code of conduct, maybe in our SOPs or in the law or other resources, but how are we actually acting on a day-to-day -day basis? And also it tells us how, what the power structure is, what people's roles and responsibilities are, who do we report to, who has authority in this or that area. All of this guides us within our daily routine or activities. So how does it start? How does culture begin? Well, I think it starts with the actions, again, those most observed actions from what I call our founders. And we can think of that as, again, whether it be from our DCMs, our managers, our supervisors, these are the people that are making the decisions about who they hire, who is going to be kept on, and are we finding people that are going to buy into and agree with it's these sorts of principles that we're trying to convey. And are these people who are going to be uh, socialized in a way that they are going to be able to adapt and adopt these ways of thinking and feeling? So whenever I talk, whether it be about culture or ethics, I'm talking about behavior. I'm talking about are we acting in a way that we become a role model that encourages employees to identify with these beliefs, these values and assumptions and internalize them. And I'll have more to say about what I mean by internalizing or intrinsic motivation in the second half. But before I get there, I just wanna say that, you know, we have witnessed nationwide incidents of government employees in different areas who have failed to live up to those expectations and values that the public have in all of us. So again, I'm trying to keep us refocused on these very basic ideas because the way we keep a culture alive is constantly being aware and focused about how people are fitting in and internalizing these values and these principles. How are we providing this information to people? Are we training enough? Are we projecting enough? And are we establishing those behavioral norms that we expect of everyone? And let me just take a, a small aside here for a moment and say, these things are critically important, not just for right now, not for just how we're adapting to these changed circumstances, but they're going to be important for the future. I don't know how many of you all have heard these numbers that I have, but I've been told that between now and 2024, which isn't that far off, if you think about how quickly it seems 2020 has gone by, up to half of the county's workforce is going to become retirement eligible. That means up to 1,300 county employees may not be here within the next four years. And now they all won't leave at once and they all will go at, over a period of time and some won't leave at all. But the point is, are we setting those cultural, basic behavioral standards for this new generation of employees that are going to be coming in, not only to your department, but to all departments throughout the county? Because you all, again, whether you're new to the county or been here for 20 years, you are all the role models now. You are all the leaders 
And, and if you will, I believe everyone has a leadership role to play in ethics. You need to take that role very, very seriously. So Brian Tracy, who is a Canadian American motivational speaker once said, become the kind of leader that people would follow voluntarily. Even if you had no title or position, too many times I see people who are promoted into either supervisory or management roles who simply want to rely on the title rather than relying on what I consider to be qualities or skills of a good leader. So one of those good skills, I think, is empowerment. What are we doing to make sure that the people around us, the people that report to us, have what they need to do their work while still holding them accountable for what they do? And humility. I think the best leaders are ones that realize not only that they don't know everything, not only that they don't have strengths in every area, but realize that it's not about them and doing what needs to be done without wanting great fanfare or reward or praise, because ultimately leadership is not about glorious crowning acts. It's about keeping your team focused on a goal and motivated to do their best to achieve it, especially when the stakes are high and the consequences really matter. It's about laying that groundwork for other success and then standing back and letting them shine. Because the most uh, effective employees, in my view, are those employees who feel valued and feel as though they are adding value. Because when we show that we trust our people to do the projects, the tasks that they're assigned, they feel better about the work and we can feel better about the group overall. So let me start to introduce to you these new concepts about ethical fading. And what do we mean by this phrase, ethical fading? Well, this is a term that N. Tenbrunsel first described in an article in 2014. And the way she describes it is, it's the process by which the moral colors of an ethical decision fade into bleached hues that are void of moral implications. Well, what, that, that, you know, that, that sounds cool, but what does that mean? I, I think what she's getting to is the fact that, as she identifies, our moral decisions are made in the same parts of our brains that process emotions. And so moral decisions tend to be made almost automatically and instinctively. And because of this, they are more prone to self-deception. In other words, when we try to take an issue, a decision, and an action that has clear ethical implications, and we push it aside and try to make it some other kind of issue. For example, this type of self-deception occurs in the workplace when employees may see initially an ethical dilemma as something else, as either a financial or a personal dilemma, trying to take the ethical dimension out of it. So seeing a dilemma, for example, such as not completing a report, as a choice that could affect a personal financial stability allows someone to make an unethical decision while still referring to themselves as an ethical person. And they do buy this by this ethical fading because they say, oh, well, that wasn't an ethical decision. That was a financial decision. And so ethical fading takes us away from or eliminates the awareness that we are, in fact, making an ethical decision. And I have this conversation a lot with people, and I've been doing these trainings now for many, many weeks in this setting and through these different electronic media. And people have identified to me how not only perhaps within the county, but again, things we see in the media nationwide, how ethics is sort of being pushed aside especially when we see these examples of people in a government role who are violating the public's trust and expectations. But there are consequences 
when we engage in this kind of ethical dating. So Tim Brunsell argues that ethics, all this ethics training that we do can become null and void if ethical fading is occurring. Because no amount of training, no amount of codes can teach an individual how to navigate an ethical dilemma if they aren't willing to see it in the first place. So her argument for self-deception provides another barrier, obstacle, you, if you will, for if the cause of an ethical behavior isn't because we don't have enough information, it's not because we don't have enough training. You're going through two hours of training this afternoon, but when we engage in this trait of self-deception, then all of this becomes for naught because we're not actually discouraging that ethical behavior because no one is acknowledging there's an ethical component to what they're doing in the first place. So the way we spot this, the way we can overcome these prejudices and how we can handle the emotional strain in the workplace is ethical behavior is not limited to just to unethical people. Uh, you know, Trumbensel points out the fact that everyone practiced self-deception at some point. And this can be the start to addressing this sorts of unethical behavior in the workplace properly when we acknowledge that it is a very human tendency. So here are examples of ways people can engage in ethical fading through their conduct and through statements that they make. For example, they don't pay me enough. I push aside these ethical concerns. I'm not paid enough for doing that. No, we're, it's expected of all of us. I earned it. They owe me. They can afford it. Nobody will know. No one will care. I'll never get caught. And then one of the biggest ones, everyone else does it. Using that as an excuse, again, a rationalization to fade the ethical considerations of what we do. And the sort of other way of expressing that, the one that really kind of drives me up the wall, is when someone says either everyone else does it or it's just the way we've always done. The reason I don't like that as a re rationale or justification is, I, I agree, we have to acknowledge and we have to honor past practice, but only when it has a good justification or rationale behind it, because things change. Laws change, rules change, instructions change, so we cannot just rely on that's the way it's always been done. So some other examples of what we might call ethical fading. And again, kind of separate yourselves from what may be strict uh, rules with regards to you know, personal rules and so forth. Just think about these in the general. Staying late one day means you can leave early another because you're owed and overtime is not allowed. Well, again, I'm not really talking about the overtime issue here. I'm simply talking about how are we pushing aside these questions, these obligations, and how do we rationalize? Not completing a log or leaving out details or facts because, because everybody else does the same and there are not enough hours in the day to do everything asked of you. Well, that may be true, but that's the time where we have to have those conversations with the people that we're accountable to to say, hey, I'm drowning here. And so rather than just you know fudging the numbers or we're fudging the reports, let's do things properly, because many times, especially when we do these reports, logs, what have you, when we do try to, to sort of finesse or, or skirt around them, that can come back to haunt us. Ignoring even the basics, the statutes, the ordinances, the policies, the procedures, and even what our management instructs us to do because you've always done something a certain way and you think no one else is willing to do all of those things required of you. No, these again, these are the things that get us in trouble. And whether we write it down or not, I think we all inherently have a good sense of what's proper, not only what's legal, but also what's proper. What if it was shown on the news the next night on, in video, or if it was printed in the media the next day, what are we doing and how does it represent us as an organization? And 
finally ignoring signs and not fulfilling the needs of those who may be detained or residents because it will only create more paperwork. Look, everything we do creates paperwork. That has a purpose, but it doesn't mean that we stop doing those things we are ex that are expected of us just because we have to fill out another form. Because there are consequences when we allow this sort of ethical fading to occur. Again, people observe us. They see when we leave early uh, without knowing that you've stayed late and follow suit without justification. Now we have multiple employees who are all leaving early because they saw you do it once. Inaccurate details that are or mis missing information reports, that, that's just poor public service. And it could result in miscommunication. And the consequences could be severe in that, again, it might lead to a complaint or a lawsuit. Because when we ignore even the basic requirements, those things we have written down, um, and try to, to just justify it as, you know, this is just the way we've all, all done it. It's not going to stop errors. It's not going to stop grievances. It's not going to stop disciplinary actions. It's not going to stop people being held accountable. And when we ignore these signs, and we don't fulfill the needs of those who are residents or detained, again, that in some of the worst case scenarios can lead to unnecessary, unnecessary harm to people who were hired, who you were hired to care and protect. So again, I, I think these are all basic principles. I think, you know, I'm not saying anything too controversial here, but what I am trying to do is bring us back to reminding ourselves on a daily basis of these very basic principles and expectations. So what do we do? when we become unfocused. And again, right now, there may be a certain lack of focus in our activities or in various departments. So things we can do include, you know, looking around, seeing what's going on, what's changed, asking questions. Do we need to reevaluate our goals, our rules, our responsibilities? We need to listen. We need to listen to those around us especially if we're encountering new challenges or lack of resources or lack of tools or ability or something that is restraining us from fulfilling our obligations. I think, again, we have to be willing to mediate not only internally, but with other departments. We need to resolve, again, these disputes that, may, that are going to inevitably arise in any group whether it be within an office, a department, any group that we are a part of, uh, some sort of friction or conflict is inevitable, but how do we try to address it in the immediacy of the situation rather than trying to ignore it and just hoping that it's gonna go away? Are we relying on our individual strengths and the strengths of others to again, as I mentioned in the first part of the presentation, to support each other, to build each other up, and then especially now, document our process. If things are changing, if we are doing things in different ways, simply because of whether it be the pandemic or some other change in law or policy, document, document, document. That is our platform. That is our floor. Those are the basic expectations of uh, behavior. When I was doing this presentation just recently with uh, some people over in public safety, I had Richard Clark, who's the head of uh, EOC in the county, and he really jumped in on that. He said, yes, especially when we're talking about uh, you know, fu grant funding for COVID and so forth, document, document, document. We have to make sure that our processes are going to be able to justify our expenses and survive any future examinations or audits. So there are some things that I think we can apply that require zero talent. And the very first one is simply being punctual, being on time. I mean, I know that's probably a very basic expectation for you all, but it's important. It's important to think about what's the work ethic? What's the attitude that we're bringing to the work every day? How much effort and energy are we willing to put in? 
And what is our body language when, when we're dealing with each other, whether it be remotely like this or in person, what do those nonverbal kinetic cues, what are we communicating to people? And I do so many presentations about how messages are conveyed, not just by the words that we speak, but also in our tone, our inflection, our facial expressions, all of these build into the message. And that's going to determine how that message is received. Uh, continuing to have passion for what we do. And I know that can be hard sometimes, but try to stay engaged. Try to remember that what you do, again, at every level, it's important, especially within your organization. People are relying upon you for their care and safety. There is no greater responsibility than that. We have to be willing to do the extra work, to be prepared for situations, dilemmas, circumstances that may arise in our work. As well, we have to understand we're not, we're not perfect. We have to be coachable. And for those of us who are maybe providing the coaching, we need to think of the right time and place for it. It's generally not the time when emotions are running high, but we need to be receptive to how can I build my skill set? How can I build my abilities to further not only the county's mission, but also further myself professionally? When we get into these situations as we are, I think now, difficult times, we have to remind ourselves that we have the same amount of time and that time is scarce. We have to give ourselves limits. We have to give reasonable expectations. We also have to create a plan. How are we going to get from here to there, from A to Z? What steps are we going to take? And again, I would say when you've gone through that, document it so that you can know for the next time or at least have a roadmap for when this situation occurs in the future. Are we inspiring people to think of solutions, to think creatively instead of just complaining about circumstances and the things that we don't have or the resources that we lack? We have to, and some of these things I know are very easy to say, sometimes hard to do, but how do we get away and detach ourselves from negative attitudes? How do we not feed aggression? Because in my view, when we encounter people who are aggressive or angry or rude, generally that is masking some amount of insecurity or fear. We learned, need to learn to be empathetic. We need to learn that the people that are impacted by what we do and say are human beings, subject to human emotions, just as we all are. That's part of what being empathetic is all about. And then when we've gotten through these difficult times, what are our takeaways? What have we learned? What can we bring and put into our processes to try to make these circumstances uh, more manageable in the future? So that is uh, the first part of the presentation. We've gone about, I think, close to 50 minutes here. So I'm gonna take us off of share screen just for a moment I'll invite people, whether you're in the classroom or at home, wherever you are, um, you can unmute your mics and just let me ask you, uh, is this interesting to you? I mean, is there some value here? Are these things that are worthy for us conversing about rather than just going page by page through the code of conduct? I think they're they are of value, and a lot of times uh, people don't realize you know, there's a lot involved in ethics, and they don't get it, and they're like, "Wow, I never really thought about that." You know, and that's what gets people in trouble, you know, just thinking, "Well, what's the big deal?" or whatever. But if you know, you, like you read the code of conduct and ethics and things like that, there's a lot of things that are just brushed aside. So they come to bite someone and then it gets twisted around. Oh, they're just going after somebody, you know, they're on a, um, they're hunting them down kind of thing. When really some of the people who are enforcing the rules are just basically enforcing rules, you know, and then it starts to bleed into, well, they cross this little line 
Then they cross this bigger line. And before you know it, now we got a really big deal. You know, like when you say the red flags were there, but we didn't do nothing about it. it exactly. And, you know, thank you for that comment, because that's what I'm trying to get us to remember is that virtually everything we do, especially as county employees, has some ethical implication to it. And as you say, well, you know, I, I cut this corner or I skirted this rule. Now we get down that that slippery slope or that spiral. And these ten things tend to escalate. And again, I've observed this in all the different public agencies that I've worked for over the past three decades. And so it's trying to, again, bring our attention back to these things exist for a reason. And it's not just, and I'll talk about this more in the second half, not just to avoid punishment or make sure we get our salary, but it has a wider impact. So I'm just trying to, again, this may be a reminder for some people, you all may follow these great practices in your everyday work, but I'm just trying to say, we can all use a little reminder sometimes. And hopefully, you know, I'm trying to package this in a way that's just a little different. I mean, I know I've got a lot of slides, I know I've got a lot of words on those slides, but it is different than the way I've done some of these presentations in the past. Anybody else? I think it's great. Um, especially, you know, the one you, where you were talking about the effects of culture, like people work differently, you know, people have different um, insights as to how they do things. And I think, you know, everybody bringing that together and, you know, uh, working together is extremely important. You know, it, it only makes the facility run a lot smoother. Right. And again, I, I think it's learning the right mix within a team and learning mm -hmm. people's strengths and weaknesses so that we can lean on people's strengths, but also figure out ways of cultivating or developing the areas that they may be a little weaker. Because when we do that, then I think we are, again, breeding that next generation of leaders, managers, supervisors, what have you. And I think all of us as employees, we want that opportunity. We want that opportunity for personal growth. We Absolutely. don't want to feel we don't want to feel like the job I have today is this going to be the same thing in 20 years. I want to be able to feel as though there is some upward mobility and Absolutely. ability for growth. So thank you. I you want to be proud and, you know, happy doing what you're doing, you know, knowing that, like you said, there are um, opportunities for growth. And again, I think uh, just valuing one another uh, in other places, I just say, you know, and, I, and there may be a slide I have here in a bit that's just the simple power of a thank you. So how often are we thanking people for doing the things, even when it's just a normal part of their job responsibilities? Think about that. I agree. Anybody else? Everybody anxious for a break? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, uh, I've got 2.22 on my computer, so why don't we take a 10-minute break? So be back here at 2.32, and again, when we come back to start the second half, we'll restart the recording. So see you in 10. <laughs> 